say a short prayer. Father God, would you help us this morning as we think afresh about Holy Communion, perhaps think for the first time about it. We pray that you would help us this morning, guide us by your Spirit, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, memory is something that is really important, isn't it? All of us have special things in our lives, special times, special events, special people that we want to keep special in our memories. And there are various things that trigger memory, aren't there? Some of those things are deliberate, and some of those things just happen. So we deliberately keep things like photographs, don't we? Objects from the past. Things perhaps that have been written to us to preserve certain events or certain people in our memory. But all of us, and I'm sure this is, uh, I'm sure this is true for you as well as me, have those undeliberate experiences where something that we see or something that we hear or perhaps something that we taste, touch or smell immediately brings back memories flooding from the past. Sight, hearing, taste, touch and smell are known as the five senses, aren't they? And teachers here, and we've got quite a few, or ex-teachers, which I'm one, will know that it's a multi-sensory approach to education, an approach involving as many of those five senses as possible that very often produces the best learning. And that's our way in this morning to thinking afresh about Holy Communion. Now, as Tim has said, at present, Holy Communion, for various reasons that I'll touch on later, doesn't happen at this 9.30 service, but that may well change fairly soon. And this talk is therefore part of, certainly for quite a number of us, introducing the concept of Holy Communion and how God intends it to strengthen and direct our faith. And it's basically because Holy Communion is all about memory. In that passage that we had read to us just now by Heather, we heard St Paul talking about Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, gathering his disciples, and disciple means learner, gathering his learners together, taking bread of wine, which he spoke of representing his body and his blood, sharing it with them, and telling them to go on doing this in remembrance of me. Last week was Remembrance Sunday, wasn't it? When we thought about, we remembered victims of warfare in various ways. But Holy Communion is about remembering that central event of Christianity, when Jesus died, and by remembering it, bringing its significance into the present reality of our lives. When people celebrate a wedding anniversary, and here's a picture of my 25th wedding anniversary on the left up there, uh, actually, I must ask, you know, who's aged the better? Hands up if you think that I've, I've aged, aged better than Katie. Oh, come on, there must be one vote. <laughs> Hands up if you think Katie's aged better than I have. That is ridiculous, that is, that's ludicrous. And worst of all, she's here to see that happen. But celebrating a wedding anniversary like that, and it was our silver wedding last year, isn't just about the past, is it? It's about the present and the future as well. That past event of the wedding is remembered frequently by a meal, significantly, as part of celebrating and strengthening that marriage in the present, and hopefully guiding and strengthening it also in the future. And so it is with Holy Communion. And we understand Holy Communion much better when we understand its foundation in the Old Testament story. If the most important event in the New Testament is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then the most important event in the Old Testament is the exodus or escape from Egypt. Now, you probably know the story. The Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. They were being oppressed by the Pharaoh of Egypt, and God rescued them. He rescued them by bringing them through the Red Sea, and he made them his people. And he then guided and strengthened them through the desert on their way to the land that he had promised them. And early on in that story, 
we're told that God revealed to the Israelites the way he wanted them to remember that crucial event, and it was through a meal. It was through the meal known as Passover. Passover got its name from that part of the story where the Israelites had to put the blood of a lamb on their doorposts so that the angel of death passed over their houses and only affected the Egyptians. But within that ongoing Passover meal, partly through hearing the story told again, but also through seeing, touching, tasting and smelling the things associated with it, the Jews were and are still able to remember that foundational act of rescue by God that made them into his people. And just like a wedding anniversary meal, the Passover meal looked back in order to strengthen that relationship in the present and to guide its future. And for Jews, that latter reference to the future has always been particularly important. Because at the most dreadful, the most awful times in their history, sharing the Passover for Jews has proclaimed that what God did once in rescuing them from Egypt, he will one day do again, when he fulfills all of the promises that he's made to his people. Now, Jesus was a Jew, wasn't he? And that's why, like other Jews, he'd travel once a year to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And it was a time when the occupying Romans always got very nervous. They were always concerned about trouble because they were only too aware that the people that they were occupying were celebrating a festival of liberation. And that had massive implications, as I say, for the present and the future as well. So Passover was a very turbulent time in Jerusalem. But the final time that Jesus travelled from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem in the south for the Passover was different. It was different because Jesus had come to realise that God was calling him to be the means of an even greater rescue. The Exodus had rescued the Israelites from Egypt and the evil of Pharaoh's oppression, but now it was time for the whole world to be rescued from the oppression of evil itself. The evil that can't be located simply within certain bad people, the evil that, if we're honest about it, runs through every single one of us. Jesus' death was the moment when the fullness of God's love came face to face with evil. That's what the death of Jesus was all about. The fullness of God's love coming face to face with the worst evil possible and overwhelming it and defeating it. And that's why we have Jesus' subsequent resurrection, the definitive sign that evil had been disempowered, that demonstrated both that victory and also the future that those who belong to Jesus can have because of him. And Jesus wanted us to remember this. Not surprising, is it? Because it's pretty important. And Jesus wanted the memory of this to go on, shaping and changing our lives. And that's why he gave us this multi-sensory gift, which is sometimes called Holy Communion. Other Christians call it the Eucharist, which means Thanksgiving. Other Christians call it the Lord's Supper. Roman Catholics call it the Mass, for reasons that I'll refer to later. The idea, though, in every case is that by hearing, seeing, touching, tasting and smelling the bread and the wine and hearing the story, we remember in a really powerful and transforming way what Jesus did for each one of us individually and for us as a community. We learn more about who we are because of this and how we need to live in response. So in the light of that summary, five things that the Bible says that we should be doing when we receive Holy Communion. And the first is this, look back. Now this is the most obvious one, I've already covered this quite a lot, but it's still important to think about. Christianity isn't primarily a set of ideas, it's about an event, a historical event, 2,000 years ago, when God's love dramatically and decisively broke into this world through his son Jesus Christ. And that love, as I said earlier, was revealed to the greatest degree possible when Jesus died, which is why it was powerful enough to break the control of evil over the world. Holy Communion, particularly at those points where we hear the story of Jesus' death repeated, and we see the bread being broken visually in front of us, and the wine poured out, 
it's there to remind us of that unique act of self-giving love that Jesus went through for us. Love is transforming. When we encounter genuine love, it changes our lives. And Holy Communion is given so we can experience that love more deeply. So we can look back and remember in a way that really grasps us and really transforms us this incredible act of love that God performed in Jesus Christ for every single one of us. And the communion liturgy that we use at 11 o'clock and we'll use here if we introduce Holy Communion says this, and I've highlighted the bits in yellow because the older I get, the more meaning these words have to me. Draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in, feed on him in your hearts with thanksgiving. One of St Paul's most moving statements is where he talks about living by faith in the Son of God who loved me, he says, and gave his life for me. And Holy, Spirit, Holy Communion is given so that we can look back in a similar way and it can become really personal to us and we can become transformed by this reminder of God's huge love for us. So that's looking back. Another uh, less obvious part of Holy Communion, but still important, is to look forward. After Paul quotes those words of Jesus about doing this in remembrance of him, St Paul says this, For whenever you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And Jesus himself, in Luke's account of the Last Supper, said this at, uh, before he took the cup, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Holy Communion, as well as looking back, has a vital forward-looking dimension as well. And this makes greater sense when we remember that the goal of the Bible is new creation. There's a verse that occurs a couple of times in the Old Testament that speaks of a day when the whole world will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And according to the New Testament, both the risen Jesus and the Holy Spirit are the first fruits of this new creation. And therefore, when we receive the bread and the wine that represent the risen Jesus, the Holy Spirit gives us a foretaste of that new creation that God has promised us. And just as when the Israelites in that old story from the Old Testament were travelling through the desert and God provided them with heavenly food, manna from heaven and quail in the desert, so Holy Communion is intended to be similar. Supernatural food and drink, in one sense just ordinary bread and wine, but filled with God's presence in a special way that sustains and nourishes us on our way to the inheritance of the new creation that God has promised us. So looking back, looking forward, but another part of Holy Communion is that we're meant to look inward. And this was a particular emphasis of that passage that Heather read earlier. Christianity rests on what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. It rests upon his grace rather than anything that we do. But it's also true that repentance, being determined to turn around, turn from our sin, and to allow God's Holy Spirit to shape and change us, that's a vital part of receiving God's grace. And that's why an important part of Holy Communion is confession. That encouragement that we're given to examine our hearts and what needs to change to put us in a right relationship with God. Confession tends to be a private thing between us and God within Protestant Christianity. Now that's got the strength of showing us that we can go directly to God, but it's got the weakness that we can sometimes be letting ourselves off the hook rather than really confessing our sins. And that's why it is sometimes good and really powerful for us to make a confession of sin to someone else that we really trust. It can be a member of clergy, but it doesn't have to be. If there's another Christian who we really trust that we can make a confession of sin to, very often that can be incredibly liberating. And it can be a way of really assuring us that that sin has been taken away and we can renew our relationship with Jesus Christ, symbolised 
by the gift of Holy Communion. And closely linked to this, and a particular emphasis of that passage that we read earlier, is actually the next thing, which is looking around. When St Paul, in that fairly stern passage, speaks to the Corinthian church about examining themselves before they take Holy Communion, the major thing that he's actually speaking about is their relationships with others within the church. One of the big problems in the church in Corinth were the divisions in it between rich and poor. And Paul is emphatic that if people receive the bread and the wine without being bothered about the unity of the body of Christ that they're eating, then they're eating judgment upon themselves. Holy communion, in other words, isn't just powerful in a positive sense. If it's taken in the wrong spirit, it can be just as powerful in a negative sense. It's something that we're given, you see, not just to bind us closer to Jesus, but to bind us closer with one another as well. And that corporate sense, that sense that we're brothers and sisters, really what I referred to earlier when I gave that sad notice earlier, that is a crucial and indispensable part of what Christianity is all about. And communion is given to strengthen those bonds between us, because families eat together, don't they? And that's what communion is given, to bind us together as a family that eat together, and therefore the spirit in which we relate to other members of the church family is seen as a really crucial part of it. And finally, when we receive Holy Communion, we're also meant to look outward. The whole point of God calling us to be part of his family is so that we can be his ambassadors, we can be his missionaries to the rest of the world. God doesn't call us to be a holy huddle, a little club. He calls us to be a missionary organisation to New Morden. And the whole reason why God nourishes us through the gift of Holy Communion is to equip us for that task. St Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians that the Christian struggle is against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I think we've got the words to that, haven't we? Yeah, there they are. He says our struggle is not against flesh and blood, so it should say our, not out, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul says we're involved in a spiritual battle and it would be pretty unfair if we were up against the forces of evil with nothing other than our own sort of natural skills or abilities. We need God's supernatural power to take that struggle on and Holy Communion is intended to be part of this. Roman Catholics call Communion the Mass because the last line of its Latin liturgy is Ita Missa Est which speaks of being sent out by God into the world. And the Anglican liturgy ends in a similar way, with go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And we must never forget that every blessing that God gives us, including Holy Communion, is intended for the purpose, not of just sort of helping us, but equipping us to be God's light, God's love in the world. Now, of course, all of this, and you might wonder uh, this throughout this talk, all of this begs the question, why don't we have Holy Communion at this 9.30 service? Well, the answer certainly so far is this. It's basically because of our children. Because of its multi-sensory nature, using sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell, Holy Communion is just made for children. It's just, you, if you wanted to invent something to teach children about the death of Jesus, you couldn't do better than come up with Holy Communion. And yet the Church of England, in its wisdom, says that for children to be able to receive Holy Communion, even when they're baptised, they basically have to be over seven years old. I have to check up on their understanding, something I never have to do with adults. I have to send their name to the bishop. And they basically have to prove that they deserve something that should be theirs by right. Infant baptism, which shows that the very youngest members of Christ Church here are full members of the church. They're not members in waiting. They are full members. That's core to this 9.30 service, isn't it? Being a shush-free church is all about saying to our youngest members, you are full members. You don't have to wait 
your full members from the word go. And the arguments for giving children the sacrament of baptism and then denying them the sacrament of Holy Communion are really pretty much non-existent. So it is going to take some working out. I think it is time that we moved to having Holy Communion as part of this 9.30 service. And at the moment, the non-presence of Holy Communion within this service is a definite weakness of it. There are loads of other ways in which we express that we're community together, but this is a really powerful way which is going to take us a notch forward. But on the other hand, for it to be Holy Communion, I firmly believe, it can't exclude any of our members. And that's the tricky bit, how we respond to that. And it is a bit of an open question. Quite often at the end of a sermon, I want to end it by saying, well, this is how I understand it. But actually, this is very much a sort of, we're going to have to work on this and think through how we respond to it. Holy Communion is the most wonderful multi-sensory gift that God gave his church. So whether we could remember this supreme act of love in Jesus Christ for every single one of us. But that is the crucial thing. That's why I firmly believe every single member of the church, without exception, should be able to receive it. We'll carry on thinking about this subject. We will carry on thinking about how we can introduce Holy Communion at this 9.30 service. But we want to do it, and I believe God wants us to do it, in a way that will actually affirm to the proper degree every single one of the members of this church. Tim. Tim.